Heavenly Father, I humbly beseech you to see before you a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, and a sinner of your own redeeming, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. A pandemic, a hurricane, you imagine uh, your own chaos at this moment. Sometimes I think it is hard to think of God acting in history. It is easy to believe in a divine watchmaker, uh, uh, that we are masters of our own destiny, curators of our own lives. We might say uh, at times that we feel alone to figure it all out. It's easy for us to think that history has no meaning and that God is distant. Life can appear like nothing more than living, working, paying taxes, and dying. Some philosophy and theology suggests that we should get what we want, regardless of the cost to others. Uh, Neo-Darwinian's notion that life uh, is no more than the operation of chance necessity says Jacques Monod, or the blind watchmaker suggests Richard Dawkins. Uh, uh, in these worldviews, as in much of our own daily frame of mind, time seems to obliterate all meaning. Uh, nothing lasts, nothing endures. Uh, and that sense that I am at the center of my universe. This really is probably not much different than how the Israelites may have felt in the midst uh, as we find them in Egypt in our passage from Exodus today, uh, how they may have felt in, uh, as they were enslaved and worked to death, uh, murdered, objectified, commoditized, that they were seen as chattel. They also were swimming in a sea of Egyptian gods while they served one God, they existed in a polytheistic universe, if you will, uh, with cyclical time, uh, a pace of seasons, a rise and fall of the Nile. Rabbi Jonathan Sachs suggests that we have in our reading uh, of Exodus a monumental proposition, though. He writes, in the darkest night, Israel was about to have its greatest encounter with God. He wrote, hope was to be born at the very edge of the abyss of despair. There was nothing natural about this, nothing inevitable about this. No logic can give rise to hope, as Rabbi Sachs says. No law of history charts a path from slavery to redemption. The entire sequence of events was a prelude, a prelude to the single most formative moment in the history of Israel, and that is the intervention of God in history and in the matters of humanity. God tells Moses, I am Hashem. This might be translated, uh, I am the God who acts in history, says Sachs. This is essential in that for Christians, like us, as Stanley Hauerwas likes to say, we believe in a God who raised Jesus after first having raised the Israelites out of Egypt. With Moses today, we receive a revelation that the God who walked in the shade and the eve of the day with the first humans is re-engaging in history. This engagement is one that makes Jesus' birth, ministry, crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension, part of the whole arc of God's historic action that began when God first separated the waters uh, and brought forth the dry land. This is a historical engagement which raises our eyes as well to an eschatological vision, a vision at the end times, of God's beginnings, God's garden imaginings, all the way to the end of time. That in Christ's actions, that which was separated is now being brought together. Those who have taken advantage and oppressed each other 
Uh, those wounds are now being healed. Heaven and earth in the end will be knitted together. When God is known as Hashem, this is the revelation of a God who interacts, a God who frees, who liberates, who unbinds, a God who is active in the world of the Israelites and is active today. We have the, for the first time when Moses receives this revelation of this new name, Hashem, versus El Shaddai, a prophetic moment we find affirmed this idea that historical events themselves have a value. They participate in the narrative of God. Historical facts thus become not only moments of human interaction with other humans, yes, that is true, but also, but also humanity's action, participation and partnership in relationship with God. As religious philosopher Mircea Eliada pointed out, the people of Israel were the first to discover the meaning of history. Uh, the, uh, the fact that the epiphany of God takes place within it. There is more though. When Moses asks God who God is, we have an answer for God of, uh, from God about hope and about the future. This is one of the most mistranslated passages into English and has been so since the time it was first translated into Greek and then Latin. You've often read or heard God's answer in this way, uh, I am who I am. I am he who is. The better translation, says Rabbi Sachs, is I will be what, where, or how I will be. These are words of the future tense. So it is that God who will act in history will do so in this moment of revelation to Moses and the Israelites, but now and in our future. Community and history become an environment, you see, of change and transformation. Here is hope, here is the idea that God will continue to act. Here is the God who interacts for justice and continues to do so. Here is a God who desires kinship among the brothers and sisters of humanity and faithfulness. Here is the God who has created humanity to engage in the work of future making, in God's work of ingathering. The God who interacts in history and in the future is the God who relishes human freedom. Again, I turn to Rabbi Sachs here. This reminds us that the future is always the sphere of freedom. Because while we cannot change yesterday, we can change tomorrow by what I do today. Interestingly, science as observation typically only speaks of the present or the present past observed. Kalia Jokes Williams, the Dean of Worship at Candler School of Theology, suggests that even though we can never rewrite history in the past, nor erase its scars through the critical remembering of community, as we do Moses' story today, in communion with God and with each other in this moment, even as we do so across the airwaves, we can, by the grace of God, undo the chains of bondage that haunt us from history's events. And you and I, with God, can move toward a future of hope, William says. Like Moses, we stand at the precipice of tomorrow with the God of the future. Our past is our past. Redeemed. You and I are freed from it. We are given opportunity to change. We're given opportunity to work beyond our own individual flourishing for the flourishing of others and of God's vision for creation. We are given the chance tomorrow 
to do good and to change our lives and the world around us. Moreover, we do so. We do so. Yes, with the God of our fathers and our mothers. But we do so with a history-making God and a God of the future. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.